It's good to have Mike Levi with us this evening to speak about the kinder transport. And um, you go ahead, Mike, tell us all about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very short you. introduction. So Very short, yes. It's up to you now. Well, I prefer short introductions because then there's less to live up to. So uh, you've got not given me anything to live up to, which is fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you for inviting me to talk today. My voice is a little bit hazy because I'm just about recovering now from bout of the you-know-what, COVID-19. Didn't hit me very hard, but it's it certainly had a little effect on, my, on the power of my voice. So if I do have to stop and take a drink, then apologies. Um, uh, yes, I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, well, it's actually about a book which I've just uh, written and is just coming out this week, actually. Um, and I'm going to uh, share my screen with you. So hopefully this will work. I've hopefully, yes. Can you see that? Yep, that can now be seen. Good. So I'm looking here at, uh, I've called, well, the book is called Get the Children Out, Unsung Heroes of the Kinder Transport. It looks at the history and mechanics of the Kinder Transport as a major rescue mission in the I guess in the pre-Holocaust era period, um, and looks at the, the individuals and the groups of people who were involved in the organization of the rescue, in the welfare of the children once they were rescued. Um, and hopefully the idea is to bring forward the kind of forgotten figures behind what was, uh, by all measures, really a very remarkable uh, piece of history. It's also the one area in British history where I think one can relate much more clearly the Holocaust and the history both on our own doorstep uh, in Britain, because of course Britain, apart from the Channel Island, was not occupied by the Nazis. So it's been quite common for certainly British school kids, students and so on to think that the Holocaust is something that happened a long way off many, many decades ago. But in fact, as my book tries to show, the impact certainly of Hitler's policies towards the Jews had a significant impact on, on the UK, uh, and particularly through the Kinder Transport Programme. So let me uh, move on to my second slide. Hopefully that's come up. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this set of uh, figures in bronze. Um, at the Liverpool Street Station in London, one of the major terminals in, in London. Um, it's a bronze by a sculptor called Frank Meisler, uh, and it depicts five children arriving with suitcases and satchels and so on. And if you look carefully, you'll see railway track indicating that they've arrived by train. Uh, and also around the statue, around the monument, a series of... Um, city names, Vienna, Berlin, uh, Prague, and so on, showing that they have come from European cities and arrived here at Liverpool Street Station. Uh, it is one of many uh, monuments by Frank Meisler, who himself was a kinder transportee, uh, to be seen all over Europe. There's probably one on your own doorstep somewhere nearby. There's certainly one in Berlin, uh, in Hamburg, in Gdansk in Poland, in Prague, in the Czech Republic, and in Vienna, uh, and Hug of Holland as well, and here in Liverpool Street in London. And it commemorates the arrival of 10,000 children, uh, mostly Jewish, not all, but mostly Jewish, between the 2nd of December 1938 and the 1st of September 1939. So the rescue of 10,000 children was the largest single act of rescue, I guess, in the whole of what we might call the Holocaust era, you know, roughly from the rise of the Nazis to the end of the Second World War. When, certainly when British people are considering who was behind the organization of the Kinder Transport, one name, tends to come to mind because it's a name that was very prominent in relation to kinder transport history. And that is Sir Nicholas Winton, who you may have or may not have heard of, but certainly in Britain, um, he became a very well-known figure. One of the reasons why he became a very well-known figure was because 
he lived to a hugely great age, to the age of 106, and he was still active right up until the very end of his life. Uh, and he was commemorated and celebrated um, in the media, on TV, as one of the, or if not the, preeminent kinder transport rescuer. So famous was Sir Nicholas that on his, what would have been his 111th birthday in 2020, Google uh, featured him in a Google Doodle. You don't get much more famous than that. And there you can see in that Google Doodle of, of that year, just a couple of years ago now, uh, a young, young man kneeling with, he's got glasses on and he represents Nicholas Winton as a young man, welcoming the children off a train, presumably Liverpool Street Station in London, um, as part of the Kinder Transport programme. So 10,000, the Kinder Transport is the rescue of uh, approximately 10,000 children, of whom 90% came from the German, so-called German Reich. In other words, Germany, Greater Germany and its annexed uh, Austria, um, those annexed, of course, in March 38. So 90% of the kinder transportees came from Germany and Austria. 6% of them came from the Czech lands, from Bohemia and Moravia, and principally from the capital uh, city of Prague. Nicholas Winton was responsible only, only for the rescue of the Czech children. In other words, 6% of the kinder transport children were rescued thanks to the uh, work of Nicholas Winton and a team, not just him, but a team of people. So my question really was, if Nicholas Winton, the most famous kinder transportee rescuer, uh, saved 6% of the kinder transport children, who saved or who helped rescue the other 94%? And the answer, if you asked almost anybody who hasn't read my book, <laughs> the answer would be, we know not because those are names that generally have not been commemorated, celebrated, or remembered. Uh, I, I once, I met St. Nicholas many times, actually, in his latter years, <clears throat> from a relatively young man of 97, I think he was, right up to his death. And I asked him once, why do you think your name has been celebrated, whereas other names have not? And he said very modestly, and he was a very modest man, well, one very simple reason, I outlived everybody else. So it does, you know, history does a good turn if you can outlive your uh, fellow um, men and women. So my book really is, the aim of my research was to try and find out who the other people were that were responsible and how, how they did it. So let's just very quickly look at, back at some history, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but just in case you're not, uh, well, I'm sure you will have, yeah, I'm sure you are, but in case a little bit rusty on it. In terms of the refugee crisis of the 1930s, there were several flashpoints. Of course, the, first of all, the uh, election of Hitler and the Nazi party in January 33, and anti-Jewish measures taken really within weeks of the arrival of the Nazis in power. Jews, for instance, by March 38, or 33, were already being forced out of the civil service and certain professions. And that led to a trickle of refugees, adult refugees coming out of Britain, looking, sorry, looking at Germany, uh, looking for refuge in countries like Britain, but also Holland, Sweden, uh, France, USA, and so on. And then of course in 35, the Nuremberg laws uh, robbing German Jews of citizenship. So uh, that again was a signal that they were not just not welcome in the country, but now were strangers in their own land, <clears throat> to quote from the Bible. Then in March 38, the annexation of Austria by Hitler's Germany and the resulting mass exodus of Austrian Jews to countries of relative safety, of which, for instance, the Czechoslovakia was one. So many uh, Austrian Jews fled to Prague, um, thinking that would be a safe haven course it turned out not to be in in uh, subsequent months then in october 38 following the infamous i guess munich agreement the occupation of the czech sudetenlands the borderlands around greater germany 
uh, occupied by Hitler's troops. And again, that led to a flood of refugees, not just Jews, but also social democrats, German social democrats, certain German liberals, thinking about the audience here today, uh, again, into countries of relative safety like France, Netherlands, uh, and Prague, and some to Britain, some to USA as well. But the real turning point was, without a doubt, the events of the 9th and 10th of November 1938, that of so-called Kristallnacht, which uh, I'll come to in a moment. And then finally, in March 39, the annexation by Hitler of uh, Bohemia and Moravia, the Czech lands, uh, with its capital in Prague, again, led to an attempted uh, flight by Jews who had thought that Prague was a safe place. Now, definitely not. And they also tried to get out. So there were those various flashpoints uh, in refugee history uh, leading up to the beginning of the Second World War in, in, when, of course, any kind of flight was then impossible. <clears throat> so the countdown to the kinder transport really begins, or in earnest, I guess, from the 9th and 10th of November, 1938. Uh, it was a nationwide pogrom, well organized by the Nazis throughout the whole of Greater Germany. Um, and as you can see from the right hand side there, some of the headlines in the newspapers, pogrom, Rages through Germany, that was a news chronicle, which was a liberal newspaper, uh, very much one worth celebrating, I think, although it's long since gone, but was a liberal newspaper, national newspaper in Britain at the time, and was stoically anti-Hitler, anti-fascist throughout its, uh, the whole of its uh, editorial uh, history. Um, it's a great newspaper to look back on, I think, news chronicle, learn a lot from its correspondence in Germany, in Berlin, and Vienna, who were very prescient in terms of what Hitler was up to. Um, and the Times, bottom right hand Times, London Times, where we're told that Dr. Goebbels condones the anti-Jewish pogrom. Actually, of course, not surprisingly, he condoned it as he was one of the main organizers uh, of the pogrom. So this uh, mass pogrom in which we don't know, but hundreds and hundreds, possibly up to 800 synagogues were burnt down overnight. 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps such as Sachsenhausen and Dachau, Buchenwald, uh, already becoming notorious names even well before the final solution period begins in 41. Um, and um, Jews beaten in the streets uh, and a mass um, program really of excluding Jews remaining uh, schools were closed down, businesses destroyed or closed, and so on. And so it led to a, a, a panic wave, really, amongst German and Austrian uh, uh, and Czech Jewish populations to try and get out. Uh, at the same time, as they were trying to get out, uh, the gates of immigration were, of course, being closed by the Western powers who didn't want to see large scale immigration uh, coming in to their country. And there you can see some well-known photographs taking the time of the November pogrom, the Kristallnacht pogrom, smashed windows, daubings on windows and so on. This was really a point in which the Jews of Germany and Austria realized that, uh, that they were in grave danger. And also the world, I think, for the first time realized through the headlines in newspapers, newsreels and so on, that the Nazis meant business for the first time, that Jews were now in mortal danger. And that was the language being used at the time, that Jews were in mortal danger, meaning that their lives were at risk and that this was, was no going back. This was a real turning point. <clears throat> and there were uh, lots of eyewitnesses to what happened over that night. Here is a a report by a Quaker lady with the wonderful name of Apollonia Rissick, who was part of a British fact-finding mission sent out a day or two after Kristallnacht to see for themselves what was happening. And those reports were being brought back to London, where it was then very clear from those eyewitness accounts that the Jews were being harried and uh, persecuted on a scale. As one newspaper said, not seen since uh, the days of medieval barbarism. Um, 
So what was the response of the British government to the uh, terrors of Kristallnacht? Well, the answer was that they were willing for the first time to allow at least the children or some Jewish children to escape what the persecution in Germany and Austria. Uh, and I'm just going to spend a moment or two on uh, this gentleman, Sir Samuel Hoare, who was Home Secretary uh, at the time. One of Neville Chamberlain's right-hand men, sort of Archer Pisa. He was very much in favour of the Munich Agreement. Um, but an interesting character. He was a Quaker by birth. His family were well-known Quakers. And he was, I think, he could be described, I think, very much as a man of high moral principles. And so he didn't need telling twice that the situation among, for the Jews in Germany was that of grave danger. And a delegation, in fact, two delegations went to visit the government to say that, look, although we realise Britain can't take in all of Germany and Austria's half a million benighted Jews, at least the children uh, could be rescued. And so on the 21st of November 1938, uh, Samuel Hoare addressed the House of Commons to tell Parliament that he would give a go-ahead for a child rescue programme, the so-called kinder transport. And I think it's quite interesting just to analyse some of the things he told Parliament on the night of the 21st of November, uh, 11 days after the pogrom. He says, I have to be careful to avoid anything in the nature of mass immigration, which would lead to an anti-Jewish movement. So he's closing the door on uh, essentially a mass immigration, a, a sort of asylum, a mass asylum program. This would not happen. He says, we might provide a temporary home here so that he was reassuring Parliament that the children who were allowed in under the kinder transport program would only be here temporarily. They would be given what we call transit visas, which meant they were not going to become British citizens, but were here uh, until things had calmed down and they could go to some unspecified third country. He says, I believe that we could find homes in this country for a very large number without any harm to our own population. So this was a kind of rhetoric, which I think is all too familiar today, of course, that uh, asylum seekers and refugees somehow do harm to a local population, presumably, you know, through uh, taking jobs or undercutting wages, that kind of thing, or, you know, stirring up um, street violence against them. Well, he believed that letting children in could be done without any harm to the British population. And then he says that the voluntary committee, which I'll talk about in a moment, would be prepared to bring over here all the children whose maintenance could be guaranteed either by their funds or by generous individuals. In other words, that uh, the government was not going to give a penny towards the upkeep of these children uh, and that it had it on the authority of the organising committee that funds would be raised privately to look after the children once they were here. So with all of those caveats, and there are many, as you can see, uh, Samuel Hoare announces to get to Parliament that the programme of allowing uh, unaccompanied children up to the age of 17 and not beyond uh, would be allowed into the country. And he finishes off with a bit of a flourish, I think. He says, by doing the things that are morally right, we shall achieve something which is worthy of the name of the British nation. And so he appeals to Parliament's uh, sense of moral rightness that this refugee rescue program, limited though it was, uh, could be argued on, on grounds of, mo of morality, which is an interesting twist to all the things that he'd just been telling Parliament. Uh, no vote was taken. Uh, some books say that there was a vote in Parliament to allow the children to come. There's not a, there was not a parliamentary vote, it was a statement by the minister saying this would happen, and it did happen. So how did the Kinder Transport Programme begin in late November 38? Well, 
What's important to say is that there were thousands of registrations already in place in Berlin and Vienna, actually following the Anschluss in March 38. So in other words, really from the occupation of Vienna in 38, March 38, parents were already registering their children to be uh, sent to safety in some third country. So the kinder transport was very much pushing against an open door uh, in terms of parental uh, acquiescence to, to the programme. And there were desperate calls really from organisations in Germany and Austria to the wider world to at least allow the children to get out of danger. Also, <coughs> the British offered to waive visa regulations for these children, partly in response to rejection of requests by Zionist agencies, in, particularly in Berlin, to send the children to mandate Palestine. So Chamberlain and his government firmly rejected uh, 10,000 children to be sent to what was then British territory in Palestine. And one might argue that the allowing of 10,000 and more children to Britain was a kind of sop, if you like, to this rejection. I think that's arguable, but uh, historians will argue this one, but I think it's an interesting argument to put into the frame. There were also pleas from Jewish and Quaker representatives in London to the government to allow this door to be opened and not forgetting the moral outrage in the press and church circles, including Archbishop Cosmo Lang, who made a broadcast that was seen on cinemas throughout Britain, saying that this was a shame on Western civilization and that we should do everything we can to at least save the children. And so there was a huge outcry um, and reassurances from British agencies that the children would not be a burden on the British taxpayer and would only come as trans migrants, as we've seen already. <clears throat> so the organisation of this rescue was, was huge and complex. The idea it was one man who, like Sir Nicholas Winton, who organised this, you know, as a solo hero, I'm afraid, is very, very far from the truth. There was very close cooperation between London committees and Jewish organisations in Berlin and Vienna, and of course, all under very strict Nazi observation. And there were several uh, German Jewish and Austrian Jewish uh, organisations that were active at the German side uh, in helping to organise the exit, the exodus of these children. Um, you can see some of them there, Hilsverein, Jüdische Frauen, von the Women's League, uh, the Welfare Organization, the Rights of the Tretung, and the IKG, IKG in, in Vienna. So uh, those Jews who were still allowed to operate in Austria and Germany did their very best to facilitate the exodus of these children uh, from their lands. Also, there's a question of, of money. Where did the money come from? Well, one of the kind of surprising sources of funding for these children was the um, appeal by the former Prime Minister of Britain, Stanley Baldwin, by then had become Earl Baldwin, who put his name to a national broadcast on BBC on the 8th of this December 38, in which he appealed to British people up and down the country to raise funds to pay for the children once they were here. And actually within a few weeks of his national appeal, £500,000 had been raised from donors all over the UK. Now, that was a huge sum of money. I think it was probably the largest sum ever raised in a single appeal. And it's the equivalent of between 30 and £35 million pounds, uh, in today's money. And that was within a few weeks of the Baldwin Fund appeal. It became very much a cause celeb, a national cause celeb in Britain. Uh, with outrage against what the Nazis were doing and people at you know, all sorts of voluntary levels thinking or seeing that what little they could do, at least they could raise funds to help the children escape. Similarly, uh, organisation at the London end was uh, coordinated in a very highly organised way 
through this building, which is Bloomsbury House in the centre of London, which was commissioned by the various committees in London in December 38, to become the sort of refugee headquarters for the whole operation, not just the kinder transport children, but adult refugees escaping Germany, Austria as well. And so there was a very clever idea of having all the refugee agencies, and there were many, under one roof. Um, and it stayed under one roof until 1947. Uh, the coordination of the refugee effort to rescue and then provide welfare uh, was done really through this building in the centre of London. It's still there. I took this photograph myself about three or four years ago, um, Bloomsbury House in the centre of London. No blue plaque, by the way, or any kind of recognition that that was the refugee HQ, because as I make it very clear in my book, much of this history has been ignored, forgotten, uh, quietly swept under the carpet for some reason. And so, um, in a remarkable burst of speed, just three weeks after Kristallnacht, the first group of kinder transport children actually arrive in, on the shores in Britain. And they arrive in the port of Harwich, which is on the Essex coast. And it was such a big deal that the national and local press and newsreels were there to capture the arrival. And I've got here a clip of that a first arrival of the kinder transport children arriving from Holland and Germany before that, coming down the deck. And you'll see them in a moment arriving. Here they are. This is the 2nd of December 1930. This is the very, very first group of kinder transport the children, they look grown ups, but actually they're girls of 15, 16 year olds. Um, and they have mostly come from children's homes in Germany, particularly Leipzig, Hamburg, um, and some in, from Berlin. And they're having their name tags checked by a ministry official. The chap on the right is from the Ministry of Health because it's important to check that the children's health had been recorded and uh, recorded as being uh, healthy. And there you can see a nurse just to double check that the children are healthy and they're not bringing any diseases in with them. And in a moment, you'll see the first arrival of some of the boys. This is a part, and there was, there's the press. I told you that they were incredibly interested in the story. That became a national news story for days following the, um, following the arrival. And you'll see in a moment, there's the boys coming now off the ship. Uh, in the 2nd of December, the very first arrival of the 10,000 children who come to Britain uh, as a place of refuge. And in a moment, you'll see the ship itself, which there it is, the, the sailing ship Prague, which was the nightly ferry from Hook of Holland to Harwich. So it was a uh, calf, it was a passenger a train ferry, uh, bringing some of the children over to come through the night, through Germany, uh, through Holland. And there they've seen their very first double-decker bus. And they're being herded on the double-decker bus. And they're being taken not to foster families because it was so quick, there was not time to find foster families for the children. They're being taken to what we call in Britain a holiday camp, a camp that's normally open in the summer uh, for families to go off on holiday, you know, in the countryside. And there happened to be a camp just nearby with several hundred beds in it. And that's where those children were going to spend their first night, in some cases weeks, some cases months, in the holiday camp. And it was the holiday camp at Dover Court, which is just outside Harwich, about two miles, say five kilometres from Harwich Port. And you can see some of the little wooden huts that the children slept in and the big dining hall, the only part of the uh, camp that was actually heated. Those huts were not heated. And <clears throat> sadly, two weeks after the children arrived, the coldest winter of the century uh, came in and Years and years later, when memories are being recorded of the camp, nearly all of them say how cold and freezing it was 
in, in, in that place, but at least it was a safe place and they were out of danger. <clears throat> there you can see a local newspaper, the Harwich Standard, telling the news that the children had arrived at Dover Court and it was big, a big local story. Um, and I think a story that local newspapers suggested was a proud story for, for their town to be involved in this rescue. However, not all uh, newspapers were in favour. This is the Daily Mail, uh, German Jews pouring into the country, as you can see, and the, the, the general tenor of the article is quite hostile, reminding us that not everybody was in favour uh, of refugees, even if, they, even if they were children. In fact, many newspapers said, who knows who they are, perhaps they're the vanguard of some fifth column, perhaps they're all kind of Nazi spies, you know, coming to the country. So they were very far from universally welcomed um, in Britain, but by and large they were. So looking now just very briefly at some of the forgotten uh, rescuers involved in the campaign to get the children out. I'm gonna go relatively quickly uh, through some of these people. You may have heard of Gertrude Weissmuller-Meyer, who was a Dutch rescuer. She was based in Amsterdam, a Dutch Christian lady who had been involved in social work and looking after children's homes and latterly looking after children's homes that were very rapidly being filled by German Jewish orphans coming over the border or being sent over the border to safety in the Netherlands, certainly before its own occupation in May 1940. Um, she was um, a very doughty, very sort of brave lady who was not afraid of anyone. And because she wasn't afraid of anyone, the British uh, authorities asked her to go and negotiate with the man in Vienna who would give us permission or not for the children of Vienna to leave. That man is here. Uh, you may recognize the face, that's Adolf Eichmann, who later became notorious as the architect of the uh, transports to the final solution. But in May, sorry, in 1938, uh, in December 38, he was in charge of the so-called Jewish Emigration Office in Vienna. And Gertrude was sent to negotiate with him to get his permission to allow the children to leave Austria and come to safety under the Kinder Transport program. Well, she was promptly arrested on arrival on suspicion of being a foreign spy, but she, she created such a fuss, I mean, literally banging on her prison cell bars and demanding to see Eichmann that they let her go and uh, allowed her an interview uh, with the notorious Nazi. A notorious Nazi told uh, Gertrude that he would allow the children to leave as long as she could organize a train load of them to leave within five days. It was, I think, Tuesday, and he gave her until Saturday to get the first train load organized. And he made sure it would be a Saturday, so that would humiliate Jewish observant children because they would have to travel on the Sabbath. Typical kind of Eichmann, uh, bizarre sense of humor. However, she did manage it. And in fact, within five days, she and the IKG, the organization in Vienna, had organized 600 children to be put on one train and left uh, in, I think, the night time of Saturday night, uh, December of the 11th, I think it was, uh, 1938. Uh, that was the largest single transport of kinder transport children in the whole of the kinder transport period. Uh, they, 500 of them, of them came to, to Britain, many of them to Dover Court Camp, a hundred of them stayed behind in the Netherlands, where it was thought they would be safe. Of course, they weren't eventually, but Gertrude thought uh, they would be safe there. Uh, so Gertrude Weissmuller-Meyer uh, continued to rescue children. Several thousand children came, particularly from Vienna, under her aegis, under her supervision. And uh, surely, as I say in the book, is a name that ought to be remembered given that her, her, that one single first train was almost as many as the entire number 
that Nicholas Winton saved in the eight months that he was responsible for the Prague kinder transport. <clears throat> and then another name that I wanted really to remember was that of Helen Bentwich, who formed a committee called the Movement for the Care of Children from Germany. Uh, Helen Bentwich had been the chair of the education committee of the London County Council. So she knew a lot about children. She knew about education. She was also from a very prominent Jewish family, the Bentwiches um, and Franklin. She was a relative of um, Rosalind Franklin, who is regarded as being one of the founders of the discovery of DNA. But in the 30s, uh, I wanted to highlight Helen Bentwich because she was really the kingpin, the, the linchpin, the queenpin, whatever you want to call it, uh, at the UK end of the organisation. She put together a very formidable list of uh, mainly women who uh, helped to organise the whole operation of the kinder transport from, from the British end. And then Bertha Bracey, who was the leader of the British Quakers Society of Friends, who again played an absolutely crucial role in flitting backwards and forwards, a kind of, I suppose we would now call it, um, what would we call it, sort of, you know, uh, anyway, I can't remember, it, it, can't forget the name of it, but you know what I mean, sort of flitting diplomacy, going from London to Berlin. Um, she was a fearless lady as well, didn't care what the Nazis thought of her, and was forever the kind of go-between between the British and the Helen Bentwich and some of the German Jewish end. And they also had a very small number of but very uh, active Quakers in Germany um, that could organize some on the ground transports and uh, kinder transport organizations in Germany. So the Quakers played an absolutely crucial role in the rescue of the children. And right at the center of that rescue was Bertha Bracey, a name that again in Britain certainly almost completely forgotten, even though she amazingly lived until 1989 as a very, very 98 year old or very late at nineties. But guess what? Nobody thought to go and interview her or ask her about what she did before or during the second world war, because she was also by the way, involved in the rescue of children from the uh, Nazi concentration camp, Vectorationstadt and Buchenwald where after the war, she gathered together hundreds of children, survivors of the camps, and managed to bring them out to Britain. Uh, a name, again, completely forgotten, uh, and not even in her own lifetime remembered, which seems really criminal to me. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just going to whiz through some of these names that won't mean very much, maybe, maybe they will. Uh, Wilfred Israel, who was the a uh, de facto leader of the German Jewish community um, in, in Berlin. Um, he was partly British, which gave him a, 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 an element of protection against summary arrest by the Gestapo. He also happened to be the head of I Israel and Sons Limited, which was Germany's most prestigious department store uh, in, in that time. Um, it was such a presti prestigious department store that all the top Nazis did their cross Christmas shopping at Israel and Son. And in fact, uh, during the Kristallnacht uh, destruction of Jewish property, it was relatively unscathed. So he had a kind of access that other Jews did not have. And he was primarily responsible, I think, for organising the German Jewish end of, of the rescue. Some say that he, the whole kinder transport idea was his, I'm not so sure, but he was certainly one of the uh, authors of the whole kinder transport program. And two women that were very much involved, again, names that have been generally forgotten, Kate Rosenheim, who was the head of children's emigration uh, in Berlin, um, and uh, Hannah Kaminsky, who was the leader of the Jewish Women's uh, League, um, again, she was very much in charge of the day-to-day -day transport arrangements to get the children out of Germany. And she would often accompany the children as a chaperone on the trains. I don't know how many times she came 
uh, on the trains to London, but she always refused to stay. People begged her to stay in England, but she always went back to get more children out, as many as she could. Um, as you can see from her date of birth and death, there is that, always that grisly 1942 date that suggests, as it happens truly, that she was a victim of the Holocaust, so did not survive. And then finally, the name, another name that I wanted to talk about in my book, Rabbi Solomon Schoenfeld, uh, Orthodox rabbi, uh, based, born in London, Englishman, spoke with a perfect English accent, um, and really organised his own kinder transport. He was not one for towing the line or going along with Helen Bentwich's organisation, but rather he didn't trust the organisations in London to do what they could to get the Orthodox Jewish boys and girls out of Vienna and Berlin. And so he organised his own, what we call Schoenfeld trains to get as many children out of the country as he could. And he also, as you can see from his uniform, it's a military uniform, is it? No, it's a uniform he designed himself to fool people into thinking that he was a military man and that that would open doors when he got to Europe, both before and after the war. So he was a man of huge cheek and chutzpah who managed to rescue at least 800, we think, children from, uh, particularly from Vienna, uh, and also maybe 3,000 adults, uh, Orthodox men and women, uh, from the rapidly diminishing communities uh, in Europe. So once the once the children and the uh, were here, what then? Well, ten thousand children. Each of them had to have a home. They were not allowed to travel with their children or with their parents, and that 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 meant that homes had to be found for them. And if you think about it, many thousands of homes had to be found for them. And as you can see, um, there's a very quick map of Britain with all sorts of different points, hostels, homes ladies' committees, farms even. The children were spread right across the UK, from the north of Scotland to the bottom of Cornwall, Wales, Northern Ireland. The whole of Britain really uh, had to had kinder transport children to look after. It's part of a research programme I'm looking at now to see you know, where these children were sent and how they were looked after at a sometimes in very remote rural spots, places that had never seen Jews before. And most of the work was done by voluntary refugee committees. This one is an area that, where I've done specific research on the, I, am, I live in Cambridge, and this was the Cambridge Refugee Committee. And look at all the different things they had to do. And these were all volunteers. They had to find suitable foster families, provide hostel accommodation, find suitable guarantors, people who put money up, checking on the child's welfare. This was a you know, time before social workers were active, arranging school fees, you know, dozens and dozens of different things that the volunteers had to do in loco parentis because in most cases, the children's parents were not allowed to come with them. And I, I would say in probably at least 70% of the children never saw their parents again and so someone had to look after them and this was provided by these local refugee committees again an area that where very little research has been done there's the chairman of the Dorking refugee committee Dorking is a little town in Surrey in south of England and for British audiences that face would be pretty familiar because it's that of Ralph Vaughan Williams, perhaps the most famous English composer of his generation, who by day was a composer and by night was chairman of his local refugee committee, looking after the welfare of the Jewish children in his small Surrey, Surrey town. One of many hundreds and hundreds of refugee committees up and down the country. So um, that I hope gives you an overview of 
the scale of the kinder transport, I focus very much on Germany and Austria. I said very little about Prague and the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia as it was then. Um, and I hope I've dealt with a lot of these stories and a lot of background and history in my book, which is actually a bit of a delay. It's being published this week. So um, hope, hope you'll get a chance to have a look at it and either read it and criticize me or read it and enjoy it or whatever. But hopefully that's given you some background to what was, I think, a remarkable example of voluntary action. All the people I've talked about today were volunteers, not one of them, you know, earned a salary for, for what they did. So um, that's it. I hope you enjoyed that and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, that's very interesting. I mean, it's a chapter of history, which even people in just history like myself, no idea about, or I just read about the kinder charts, but not in this kind of detail. So um, have any questions on the subject from the audience? Neil, yes. Mike, was Nicholas Winterton right when he said he was remembered because he outlived the others? Or are there other reasons why we remember him and him alone? Um, I think he was right. Uh, we remember him because he lived long enough to become a TV personality. And once he became a TV personality, then of course, you know, fame follows. So he was on a very famous BBC programme in the late 80s called That's Life, which um, became a, a national sensation, really. Um, and really from that appearance on of that national, that state television program in which this story was, as it were, told for the first time, he really was never out of the news. And there were any number of memorials to him and celebrations and medals struck and knighthood given uh, and so on. So I think it was a question of, you know, becoming a, a media personality, if you like. So not, not one that he ever saw himself. He was the most modest of men and really hated the kind of publicity um, that, that was being given to him. But by, by the time he became well known in the 1990s, he was absolutely right that there were very few, if any, you know, uh, organizers. There were some actually having said that, uh, but they were not sought out. They were kind of quietly being forgotten, you know, in academic settings or in rural towns and villages and so on. But um, you know, just like no one bothered to ask Shakespeare's sister, can you tell me something about the life of your brother? Because she lived decades after his death. No one bothered to find out about the non-Nicholas Wintons who were still around in the 90s, which seems a great tragedy. Helder, go ahead. Uh, good evening, everybody. I really would like to thank you, uh, uh, Mike, uh, for your presentation and your extraordinary a book and also for the organizers of this uh, evening. Um, and also as a member of the Portuguese-Israeli uh, Association, I'm very thankful uh, to bring this um, piece of history, especially um, and this week, uh, last week when Whoopi Welber was giving some extraordinary comments. Uh, about uh, what happened uh, on that uh, uh, time period. Uh, then, uh, um, but um, my question is, um, uh, how hard was to collect all the information? Uh, do you have barriers? Because many of the witnesses, uh, they are, unfortunately, they are not uh, uh, with us uh, anymore. Uh, do you found the sources, some libraries, so which were your main sources of information? Okay, that's a good question. Um, as you rightly say, there were, there were I, managed to, I managed to find one uh, foster father who was still alive at the age of 96, I think, in about 10, 12 years ago. So that was good. I managed to interview him. Um, he'd taken in a refugee child and he had very vivid memories. Um, in terms of the wider story, uh, there are some uh, there are some memoirs, you know, scattered um, that were written by, uh, for instance, some of the Dover Court camp volunteers. Uh, there was a couple of memoirs written in, you know, rel relatively obscure places, but they are there. 
um, in the uh, Wiener Holocaust Library in London, which is a very good source. There are also, again, um, in archives, there are minute books and committee records of some of the many, well, many of the committees that were in, responsible for organising the, the kinder transport. So I've had a look at those. I'm in Cambridge, so the University Library here is a remarkable uh, library. You know, it's on par with the British Library in London. Uh, and it has many, many manuscripts of the local refugee committee, minute books and correspondence and so on. So you have this piece, you know, like any bit of historical detective work, you have to piece together what there is. I mean, I've tried high and low to find any of the uh, committee meetings chaired by Helen Bentwich, for instance. I haven't yet found any. So that's a source of great um, frustration, given that she was chair of the, the main committee that brought the children to London. Um, I haven't found any committee uh, documents for the Dover Court camp. Presumably they've just been destroyed or, you know, putting a skip somewhere and lost. Um, the, I know that the Berlin records are generally were destroyed, but intriguingly, the, there are uh, thousands of records in Vienna uh, of the IK, IKG um, and the way that the kinder transport was organized from Vienna. But of course, COVID being in the way has meant I've not been able to go and look at the archives, but as soon as I can, uh, I, I'm going to have a look at the archives in Vienna to see whether there is something for a volume two <laughs> uh, there. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's typical kind of historical detective work. You have to piece together what there is. Um, there are some memoirs um, scattered around. There are manuscript documents. Uh, there are of course, many memoirs from the kinder transportees, but they often were too young to know how their rescue was organized, uh, which is frustrating. Uh, I'm now engaged in some research for the Washington Holocaust Museum, finding foster families, well, they would be siblings of foster families uh, who took in some of these children. And uh, it only last few days, really, people have been sending me private family memoirs that their grandparents wrote or diary entries that they wrote during the war about looking after these children. So, you know, I'm starting to gather a lot of new material that wasn't time to put into the book. So yeah, you've just got to look far and wide as usual. Thank you. Pavo has a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, I, we already started answering it actually because I was um, curious about the uh, further fate of these kids. Uh, these displaced kids as they became adults uh, and so on, w was there any large scale um, record kept on, on, on what happened to them? Uh, no, is a short answer. Um, th th there was a, a very useful survey done by the AJR, the Association of Jewish Refugees, that represents the interests of the former refugee children. And in 2007, they did a they put out a huge questionnaire asking uh, people for as much information as they could give about you know where they went did they stay in britain what happened to them and i think they had about 1200 respondents which is amazing uh, and they published that uh, in a gigantic spreadsheet so there is some statistical information but only in 2007 you know way way after the events and it seems from that as though the majority of the kinder transport children stayed in Britain after the war. The majority of them uh, gained citizenship in the late 40s when that was open to them to do so. Very few, very, very few, but some went back to Germany or Austria. Um, some managed to get out to America, uh, Canada and so on. But the majority of the 10,000 uh, stayed in Britain. Um, and, you know, had families and children, grandchildren, great grandchildren here. Um, I believe the AJR still has a membership of about five or six hundred former kinder transportees who are still around. Um, 
and you know thousands and thousands of children and grandchildren second and third generation again mostly in this country so of course went to israel in 48 um and uh, made a life there so a variety of, of outcomes mostly here but other places as well they certainly weren't sent back or anything like that you know there was there's no question in samuel hall's mind by the way that transmigration would mean sending them back to germany or austria that was never on the cards it was very clear that that was not going to happen um even after the war i think helder has a question now again uh, yes um uh, which was your main motivation to write about this subject in specific? Because there are so many stories that you, you could have uh, brought about it. Um, why uh, to choose this uh, particular uh, history? Uh, it really came out of um, a request about 15 years ago, maybe a bit more. What year are we in? Yeah. Um, my local authority here in Cambridge said, could I introduce the subject Holocaust Memorial Day to primary school children, that means um, 10 and 11 year olds. This was about 2002, so it's actually 20 years ago. Um, and that time, it, it was never done in that age, for it, that age group. And it just made me look into the subject and I thought, well, the kinder transport is an area that you could introduce the, you know, the bigger picture of the Holocaust to a younger audience, particularly a British audience, because it happened on our own doorstep. And it was that year, I think, 2002, that I discovered that Cambridge Re Refugee Committee minutes were still ex uh, existed in local university library. So really, it's been uh, an interest that came out of that very practical question. What am I going to teach primary, you know, young children and what would make it relevant to them locally? Um, and then it just became, you know, a question that most, I guess, researchers like to know is you know, something that hasn't been done before, a kind of, uh, you know, a question that needs to be answered. I mean, certainly one of the committee members in her minutes, uh, written actually in the 1970s, said, you know, our history is one that deserves to be remembered. One day I hope it will be. And I thought, you know, this lady is speaking to me through the, <laughs> through, through the ages. Um, if, if I'm not doing it, nobody else is. So, um, yeah, and hopefully what it what the book will do is stimulate much more research uh, into the into the subject, which I think still needs to be done. Uh, our work is uh, your work has been made very difficult, but also uh, many other researchers and uh, just private people has been made so difficult by the fact that the war World War II generation was so reluctant to speak about their experiences, particularly the people who had the worst experiences, the people who went through the concentration camps, the people who had the, the worst kind of experiences. I remember meeting as a child, people with the numbers tattooed on the forearm and my mother explaining that they'd been in Auschwitz mm. or another concentration camps. I, I remember meeting people who had been for Ravensbrück mm. and had medical experiments performed on them. But it's not something people talked about. My own uh, uh, father-in-law was in the RAF and you know, part of the bomber command. And he never managed to talk about it, okay, because my mother-in-law never let him talk. But also, he, he went to his grave without telling our children what he did and where he was. We sort of, it's a lost history. So your work now is to try to dig out what's left of it and the very few people left alive who can still talk about what little yeah. is left of that history. It's true. Yeah, it is true. Yeah, I, I mean, I really bitterly regret not starting this 20 years ago when I first got interested, you know, in, in a more serious way. I was kind of doing all sorts of other things then. Um, it's only in the last few years I've had a bit more time to do this. So 20 years ago, they would have... I mean, for instance, 20 years ago, the, um, a lady called Joan Stiebel, who was secretary of the Jewish Refugee Committee throughout the 30s, was still alive, lived to about 98, um, and was still around in London in 2000, in the year 2000, and very, apparently, you know, very compass mentis and could have been spoken to, but nobody bothered to go and ask her anything. Um, 
And you know, I could repeat that that with with many other uh, examples of people who like like Bertha Bracy. Why didn't anyone go and interview this seminal figure? You know, in a major part of uh, refugee history, uh, why didn't anyone bother to go and interview her um, uh, during her lifetime, a long lifetime? So it's yeah, it's frustrating, but you like you say, you you do you you work with what you're given. And at least there are still a few people around who remember coming as kinder transportees or remember there being British families who took them in, you know, people in their mid 90s, still with good memories who I've been speaking to, who, you know, can give you some really vital uh, personal stories. But yeah, I guess it's the same in all history. You know, nobody thinks of history as something that ought to be recorded, you know, when, while it's happening. But it's also this. Uh... On the one hand, probably wanting to forget the part of their yeah. life. Uh, on the other one, they're so modest. Even people who performed heroic acts um, uh, were so modest that they just they yeah. took nothing about it. That, that's that's a huge well, obstacle for us now. Is, I mean, Nicholas Winston himself, of course, famously didn't talk about his. Uh, it's not true, but the story was that he didn't even tell his family what he'd done. Actually, that isn't true because I spoke to his family and they said, yeah, we were told about this from when we were kids. But he didn't make a big thing of it. And he certainly you know, didn't show them any records or archives until uh, this programme came out in the late 90, 80s. So even, you know, even he didn't really want to speak very much about it. He moved on. He became a, he was a, in, I think he was also in the RAF, was he? Uh, well, certainly in the army anyway. And he said, well, my life moved on and I went on to do other things. You know, why would I want to speak about it? It was just part of my life and we moved on and, and that was it. So, um, yeah, it's only in hindsight, of course, that you see the importance of, of these stories. But as you rightly say, there is that mysterious element to the Holocaust era in that people didn't want to talk about it. I think they just didn't want to go back to that part of their life. And also the pervasive fear, which I saw in, in people, uh, they just were still didn't want to talk about it, they didn't want to come out with it in case it came back. And they're not so wrong because it's uh, there are great threats of it coming back. And that's why perhaps we should be vocal about it and, and not let it, uh, the denialism and the, and the calls for racism and, uh, and uh, murder come back. Yeah, I mean, that, that said, I mean, Holocaust Education Trust in London, uh, I'm sure there are equivalents on the continent, uh, have or certainly had a very large pool of uh, Holocaust survivors who right into their 80s and 90s were happy to go into schools and tirelessly, really, uh, speak to school children uh, about their experiences. And it's only very, you know, last year or two that this has really slowed down almost to a halt because of time. But certainly I was involved uh, with, uh, with that trust and accompanied many of the Holocaust survivors into schools. And, you know, you would hear absolutely, you know, the kids would be silent, stunned silence to actually hear and see a witness to the event standing in front of them. There was nothing to, there was absolutely nothing to replace that um, experience. I've been to Auschwitz several times with survivors and, you know, to have a survivor tell 16 year olds, this is where I had to sleep or this is where I had to, you know, be forced marched right here on this spot. There is nothing remotely that can match that in terms of the power of memory. <clears throat> Absolutely. OK, so any final question, anything you'd like to add? Anybody else? I think uh, Helder have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, basically, I agree with you, uh, Pierre, uh, because uh, the people is reluctant uh, to, to talk about the, the war. And even in Germany, uh, I never heard anybody talking about that, that time period. Uh, my father was in the colonial war in Africa. Also, many of the friends do not talk too much about that. Uh, and the people of the civil war in Spain, also as a taboo subject, and, and uh, nowadays, uh, after the refugee crisis from Syria, and uh, for, for instance, the, the refugee crisis from Venezuela, that is one of the biggest, uh, probably we will 
be, be bigger next year uh, to in, in, in figures uh, compared with the, the Syrian one. Uh, it, it's important to recover these pieces of history because we, we can see what was done at that time and wh what we are missing nowadays uh, and how we are handling the refugee crisis uh, currently. Uh, because um, Merkel was uh, very brave to, to take, uh, uh, to open the, the doors. Uh, but uh, we, we still have our own uh, refugee crisis. The, the ones from Venezuela, there are many of them coming to Europe, but the, the statistics doesn't count because many of them uh, get uh, European passports due to their uh, uh, family that they were immigrants because may, many, uh, a lot of people move to South America in the last century. And I, I think this is very important, your contribution in uh, recovering this uh, history and how the, the communities were handling uh, uh, this crisis and, and, and to rescue these child. So I think this is really, really important. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. My parents you. never stopped talking about the war, but both in the war. Uh, the point is, they never stopped talking about it, but never about the really important stuff, which I only found out 20 years, 25 years after my mother's death, which is really important and really <laughs> very, very drastic. But hey, I never heard it from her. So yeah, this is the up to the historians to dig up what's, what's left and what little we can reconstruct. Well, any final things? Mark, would you like to conclude? If anything, it's, it's always difficult to learn lessons. I'm always very uh, coy about learning lessons from history. Um, but if there are any lessons from this particular history, I think it's what the Kinder Transport says to me is the sheer power of the voluntary response. Uh, not governments, not local authorities, not councils, you know, but the sheer power of, um, of volunteers, once you know, they find a voice, um, can do a lot. Um, and I, I'm just wondering whether there is something that we can do as a common society to promote and encourage the role of voluntary agencies, voluntary and individuals, really, in a refugee rescue, because that certainly was how the kinder transport was organised. Um, uh, you know, circumstances were different, but there were lots of similarities uh, with with today. And I was very interested. I didn't kind of hadn't really kind of struck me that there was this huge number from Venezuela uh, coming to Europe. That's something I'm going to be looking at uh, with interest. I think so. Thank you for that for alerting me to that that story. But certainly, the 1930s, oddly in many ways were a time when volunteerism was at its peak, you know, because governments took a bit of a back seat really with most things, which um, was both good and bad. But the good side of it was that it allowed volunteers really to take the, take the lead um, in the rescue of these children um, and also adults as well. It's often forgotten that our 10,000 children came to Britain on the kinder transport, but 60,000 adults uh, came on different schemes um, from 33 to 39. So, um, and, you know, that's another area I think that, that ought to be looked at. And again, in almost all cases, it was to do with volunteers rather than any kind of official body. So let's hear it for volunteers. <laughs> yeah. Well, perhaps the big difference since World War II is that we now have the UNHCR, which specifically deals with uh, refugees, the UN Agency for yeah. Refugees. Uh, we have human rights, uh, UN agencies, we have uh, UNICEF, uh, we have the WHO, we have lots of agencies who specifically deal with these things. But it's true that volunteers still, there's a lot of space for volunteers. Well, Mike, thank you very much for this presentation and for this uh, for bringing to our attention this this uh, really important uh, part of history. Jeff, thank you very much for introducing Mike to our group. Very nice. And, uh,
we're looking forward to more contributions from you and um, from and thanks to all the participants for uh, for joining it uh, i'll be preparing a video and i'll post it on youtube and facebook so those who missed this evening uh, still have a chance to to follow our session thank you very much and good night to everybody thanks. good night thanks very much indeed for inviting me thank you good night good night all right